Back in the 19th century, when the word mindfulness was coined to translate the Pali term siti, it was a perfect word for the job. It was related to a, a phrase that is often repeated in churches, to be ever mindful of the needs of others. In other words, you keep their needs in mind. You take it into consideration as you go through the day and do all your activities. And even though the Buddha has you be mindful of other things, it is mindfulness in that sense that he's talking about, keeping something in mind as you go through your activities, remind, reminding yourself what's important to act on what values you have that you want to express in your actions. And the intervening here is that the meaning of the word has changed, getting further and further away from what the Buddha taught, what he meant by the word. It would be good to recover the original meaning of the word. And put it to use. We live in a time where simple acceptance is not an option anymore. There are things you have to accept, but there are other things you don't accept. This one passage where the Buddha says, if you see something unskillful is coming up in the mind, you're mindful to get rid of it. And you're mindful to give rise to skillful things and to maintain them. In other words, you don't simply watch things coming and going. You try to make good things come, and you try to prevent them from going. You're mindful of this because you remember that everything in the world that you're going to experience is going to depend on the skill with which you treat it. That requires that you train the mind. So at all times, in times of peace, in times of no peace, in times of illness, in times of no illness, the mind always has to be trained. Because the potential for aging, illness, and death is always there. The potential for social unrest is always there. Think of those dangers the Buddha has the monk reflect on. Aging can come, illness can come, death can come, society can fall apart. I need to develop an attainment that makes me safe. So even when these things do come, I won't have to suffer. Now it may seem selfish working for your own well-being that way, as everything else falls apart. But you're not making things fall apart. And part of the practice, of course, is generosity, virtue. You give things. You give your time, you give of your, your energy, you give of your knowledge. You're happy to share what you have, and then you refrain from harming. These are things you want to keep in mind at all times. As the Buddha said, the practice of virtue, the practice of concentration, the practice of right view, the attainment of release, all of these things require mindfulness. That you keep your priorities in mind. And don't let yourself get waylaid. By the latest things that are being shouted at you through the media, through whatever you hear around you. You've got to keep your priorities straight. And your priorities are that you have to develop good qualities inside. In the list of the strengths, mindfulness comes between effort or persistence on the one hand and concentration on the other. And the three are closely related. I've seen it explained sometimes that the Buddha taught two different paths. There's the path of effort and concentration on the one hand, and there's the path of mindfulness on the other. 
and the two, as they're explained in that system, are very, very different. But the Buddha never separated these things out. There's a passage where he talks about the need to develop purity of view, purity of mind, in other words, concentration, and purity of virtue. In every case, it requires a series of qualities that all go together. Desire, effort, diligence, endeavor, relentlessness, mindfulness, and alertness. So mindfulness goes right there in, the, in that series. You keep in mind that you've got to stick with this. After all, with your virtue, you want to make sure that you stick with your virtue, even when things get very difficult. If things break down outside, food becomes hard to find, other things become hard to find. Can you make sure that you're not going to stoop to some unvirtuous actions in order to get what you want? You've got to create a state of mind where you know for sure that you're not going to stoop in that way. Or even though you may feel tempted, you know that you have the re restraint that you say no. That requires diligence, relentlessness, mindfulness, alertness all those qualities together. The same when we're buffeted by the winds of good and bad news. You want to maintain your steadiness of mind, because you know whatever way you're going to react is going to be a lot more reliable if you can maintain your, your even keel inside. If you have a sense of well-being inside, it's a lot easier not to give in to influences from outside. Again, this is going to require desire, effort, diligence, endeavor, relentlessness, mindfulness, and alertness, all those qualities together. In terms of purity of view, you want to remember that the real suffering that weighs the mind down does come from inside. Things outside may get bad. But you don't have to suffer from them. You keep that in mind, which means, again, you turn your energies to training the mind. You train your desire, your effort, your diligence, your endeavor, your relentlessness, mindfulness, alertness. You keep this set of values in mind. And remember that this is all for the sake of release, for the sake of freedom. So anything that would bind you down with passion, you've got to work, again, with relentlessness and mindfulness to pry yourself free. Even to the extent, as that passage says, that even with the things that would bring you to release. There comes a point where you have to let them go, too, for the release to be total. You keep that in mind, so you're not just holding on to the path. Remember the image of the raft. You get to the other side of the river, you put the raft down. In the meantime, you learn how to hold on to the path in a skillful way. The sutta, where the simile of the raft comes, is also the simile of, has the simile of the water snake. You learn how to grasp the Dharma in the correct way. We're not here to engage in arguments and debates. We're not here to say that we're better than other people because of our views, or that we have to impose our views on other people. That would be like grasping the snake at the wrong place. The snake would turn around and bite you. But you still have to grasp. As you're practicing, you have to hold on, but hold on in the right way. You're holding on for the sake of your own cleaning up of your own mind. If you hold the Dharma in that way, again, it's like holding the snake right behind the head with a forked stick. The snake can writhe around and curl around your arms, but it's not going to do any harm. So 
you want to make sure that as events get difficult, and even when events are not difficult, and you start getting complacent, you have to keep, keep in mind what your values are. Keep in mind what you need to do. Because that's what mindfulness is for. It directs your actions. It directs the mind in the direction of concentration, because you know that that's going to be your most stable and reliable state. And it gives direction to your efforts in general. So you do keep in mind what is really important. You do keep in mind what you have to do. You're not just here looking at things, accepting whatever. I was reading recently that an article where they were saying that mindfulness is basically equanimity. Well, equanimity sometimes is a good thing to have and sometimes is not. If it makes you complacent, if it makes you indifferent, makes you apathetic, then that's the wrong quality of mind. Equanimity to be good always has to be combined with skillful things, skillful qualities. And mindfulness is what you use in order to remember when different qualities are useful and when they're not, how you have to combine them. All the lessons you've learned, you don't memorize them and run them through the mind all the time, but you have them at your fingertips. It's one of the reasons why we keep the mind still. When it's still, it's as if all the drawers of the mind, where all your valuables are stored, are available. You know where they are. So when you need something, you can pull it out. When you don't need it, you can put it back in the drawer. If the mind is a whirlwind, you don't know where the drawers are. And the dust and whatever is stirred up by the wind makes it impossible to see where the drawers are. But when things settle down, then you can see clearly. Here's the drawer I need for dealing with difficult things outside. Here's the drawer I need for dealing with lust inside. Here's the drawer I need for dealing with jealousy, anger. The drawers are all available. So your persistence, your mindfulness, and your concentration all go together. And that's how they all become strong. That list of desire, effort, endeavor, diligence, relentlessness, mindfulness, alertness also appears in a sutta where the Buddha is talking about the attitude you should have if your head were on fire. You bring all of those qualities together, put the fire out. In other words, you remember what's really important in life, and you focus there. And as for any attachments that would pull you away from what's important, you're mindful to let them go. That's when you see how important it is to keep your mindfulness strong. Because it does become your refuge of the various qualities of the path. The Buddha focuses on mindfulness as your refuge, so that all the other things you've learned about the path will be there at your fingertips. Otherwise, the things you've learned wash away, wash away, and they serve no purpose. But if you can store them away in the drawers of the mind, keep yourself calm so you know where the drawers are, then all the good things you've learned will come and show their real value.